Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out. It's a great turnout, and uh, I know it probably took uh, some effort to, to find us here, but, but it's a nice room, and, and uh, it seems like we're accommodating everybody. Um, and uh, thank you for your patience. We're, we're running a little behind. There's some computer snafu. We're uh, in our class here. So thanks for everyone who stuck around. Um, we're really happy tonight uh, to have a, a uh, talk tonight from Dr. Joe Romano, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, Dr. Romano received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Cornell. Um, he received his PhD in physics from Syracuse. And he was one of the founders of the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy, uh, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year. So uh, Dr. Romano is one of uh, maybe two or three physicists here uh, 10 years ago. And uh, you know, we now have a department with, uh, with 20 faculty and Dr. Romano was instrumental in helping get the original $5 million to sort of get the center going. But since that time, he's helped, uh, he's been a member of grants that have raised uh, more than $15 million more dollars. And so a lot of that money goes to research, and a lot of that money also goes to supporting students. Right? So we want to let you know that uh, in physics and, and a lot of times in science, uh, you can get paid for, for going to school. You, you don't end up paying tuition, you're getting supported because you're doing research right away. Uh, Dr. Romano's had leadership roles and large scientific uh, collaborations. And here's a really interesting thing that happened last year. So Dr. Romano is a co-author on two papers that came out one month after another. And uh, it turned out that each one of those papers was the, the most downloaded paper for that month. So that means that all these physicists who read these articles we're interested in not only one of his articles, which is a big deal, but in another article, you know, the very next month after. So, so that's quite an accomplishment. And uh, besides all his, his accomplishments, he's really supportive of his students and uh, very supportive of our department. So I really appreciate him uh, taking time to have this lecture. So please help me welcome Dr. Mono. Uh, palace in Granada, Spain. He 
went there in 1922 and 1936. And his last visit especially had a profound impact on him. He was not a mathematician. He, I think he failed high school. He, was, he, he did poorly in math. But uh, as we'll see, most or a lot of his artwork uh, had, has uh, mathematical underpinnings to it. He interacted with mathematicians uh, throughout his career. The three most important were uh, Paglia, uh, then there's this Roger Penrose in regard to impossible figures, which we're not going to talk about, and then a mathematician crystallographer, Coxeter, which we'll talk about at the end. Paglia was uh, connected to uh, so-called periodic tilings of the plane, which was Escher's biggest uh, obsession from 1937 onward. And it was, in his own words, his richest source of inspiration. Hit the wrong button. Okay, so here's a photo of the Alhambra. It's in Granada, Spain. Originally, it was built as a fortress in 889 and then converted into a palace in 1333. It's most noted for its decorative wall tilings, and you can see some of them in the background here. And these were done by the, the Moors. Okay, here is uh, one such wall tiling, little chevrons or, or darts or uh, kite-shaped objects, black and white, which repeat, okay, a pattern that repeats. Here's a more uh, sophisticated uh, pattern with six-pointed stars, with uh, things that look like propeller blades, with hexagons. Again, very colorful, uh, a pattern that repeats, repeats itself. It's periodic. Here's another image, uh, I'm sorry, another wall tiling, which is even more complicated. Twelve-pointed stars, six-pointed stars. You can see uh, a hexagonal pattern if you uh, look hard. Okay, so these here, this is a hexagonal pattern which repeats throughout. And up here, these little Christmas tree-like items and this particular set of tiles, this forms what's called a border pattern to the two-dimensional wall tiling, and we'll talk about border patterns in a bit as well. Here are Escher's sketches that he made in 1936 when he visited the Alhambra for the second time. And note the care that he took in doing these sketches. Okay, they weren't, you know, quick sketches. He actually did these uh, drawings on, on graph paper. If you look closely, you can see the lines of graph paper both here and here. And he carefully uh, drew the pattern, basically to ingrain it in his head. He was, he was obsessed. He was very interested in these patterns. Okay, so all of the Alhambra wall tilings are examples of what's called periodic tilings of the plane. And by periodic tilings of the plane, what I mean is you cover the plane completely, okay, a flat two-dimensional surface, using repeated congruent figures. Okay, congruent means same size, same shape. And you want to do it in a way where there's no empty spaces. Okay? Instead of the geometric shapes like the hexagons and stars and things like that that the Moors used, Escher wanted to use recognizable figures. And you'll see in Escher's prints, birds, fish, lizards, lots of different uh, animals, okay, people. Uh, uh, the, the Moors who did the wall tilings in the Alhambra were forbidden to, uh, to uh, represent human life or life in general. So they had to use geometric, shape, geometric shapes. Escher wanted to go beyond that to use recognizable figures. The fact that we want a pattern which repeats with congruent figures basically limits the types of transformations that we can do to the wall tiling to have it sort of go back into itself. And the, the four uh, transformations that we're going to consider, and we'll, we'll discuss these in detail in just a bit, are translations, rotations, reflections, and glide reflections. Now, maybe you've learned this in high school geometry. Uh, I was told by a neighbor of mine that that's, uh, these are topics that are discussed there. At least for me, I never heard of glide reflections until just last month. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and finally, just by way of definition, if, if I say or somebody says that uh, an object or a wall tiling is symmetric with respect to a particular transformation, uh, like a translation or rotation, what they mean when they say that is that it's unchanged 
after you apply that transformation. Okay. So here's a, a print by Escher, okay? Black birds, white birds, okay? It's periodic, okay? It's a, a portion of a filing of the complete plane, okay? It's periodic in the sense that you can translate, if you translate this whole figure, uh, this, this whole uh, image in the direction of the arrow shown here and here, you repeat, you recover the same pattern. Okay, so shift the pattern from here to here, it repeats. Okay, that's what a translation means. And in everything that we're going to talk about uh, from here on out, we're going to ignore the color of the, uh, of the objects. So here we've got white birds and black birds. They're different, okay, one because of the color, but two because of their outline. So we're going to ignore anything related to color because it just makes things more complicated. Okay? This particular diagram or print has uh, translation symmetry. Okay? All of the uh, periodic filings have translation symmetry given by these two arrows here. But it also has rotational symmetry. And there are two types of rotational symmetry associated with this. Okay, so here's a little demo, okay? So if you just concentrate here on this dot, okay, if you rotate the figure by 180 degrees, it returns back to itself, okay? So that dot there is a center of twofold rotational symmetry, okay? You can rotate by 180 degrees and have the image reproduce itself, okay? What about these dots here? How much can you rotate the figure to have it come back to itself if you rotate around an axis that passes through this point? 90, okay? If you ignore color, okay? If you ignore color, right, this white foot will go into here, this black foot, ignoring color, just concentrating on the boundary of the image. It goes back into itself. So this is twofold rotational symmetry. This is a center of fourfold rotational symmetry. Okay. Here's a more complicated uh, pattern with butterflies. All of these uh, works that you'll see from here on out are, are Escher's. Okay. So the translation symmetry along these arrows here. We've got dots. Okay. Look at this dot here. What type of rotational symmetry is associated with that? <coughs> How much do you need to rotate to take this wing into this wing here? So to bring this line over to here. Any guess? 45. <laughs> No, no, that's not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look how many wings here. Look how many wings meet. 60. 60. 60. 60. Wow. 60. Because six wings meet. Okay, you've got to go 360 degrees all the way around, divided by six. Okay, this is a, this is a center of six-fold rotational symmetry. Okay? What about this? You want to try this one? How many, how many wings meet here? Three. So what's the angle that you have to rotate through? 120. 360 divided by three. This is a center of three-fold rotational symmetry. And then what about here? 180 degrees, so two-fold rotational symmetry. Okay. So this particular image has all three of these uh, different types of rotational symmetry. Okay. This has what's called reflection symmetry. Okay. The translations are shown here. The reflection axes are shown here, and there would be more as well. And to say that something has reflection symmetry means that its mirror image on the right is the same as what it is here on the left. Okay? I have mirror symmetry for an axis that passes through my nose like this. 
Okay, the beetles have reflection symmetry for an axis passing through their back. Okay? So reflection symmetry is basically just flip it and you get back the same thing. Okay? So we're not rotating, we're reflecting. Okay, this is a reflection. Okay? So that's number three. Translation, rotation, reflection. The last is glide reflection. Okay? Like I said, this is something that I just learned about last year last month, okay, glide reflection is a combination of two things, a reflection and a translation, so a reflection and a shift, okay, now let's concentrate, for example, on this particular dog here, the white dog, if we reflect this white dog around this axis here, do we recover the same image? No, okay? So if we take the white dog, let's see, okay, so if we take the white dog here, okay, this one, and we reflect, he's like this, okay? But then what do we have to do to recover the same pattern? Shift him up, okay? Does everybody see that? Take the white dog, reflect, and then shift upward, okay? So that will take this dog, reflect him over here, shift him up, you get that. Okay? Same thing applies if you consider this axis here that passes through its, its jaw. If you reflect the white dog across this uh, line here and then shift up, it's the same thing. What about this axis here? What if you reflect this dog around this axis? Yes, because we're ignoring color, right? We're ignoring the, the difference in color. So if we reflect the dog around that axis, okay? So we take the white dog over here, we reflect around that axis and then translate up, you get the black dog, okay? So because we're ignoring color here, we recover the pattern, okay? So all of these axes here are glide reflection axes. Okay. Here's, a, here's a very interesting print by Escher. Okay, this is going to be a sort of a test of your uh, knowledge. Okay. It has translation, reflection, rotation, and glide reflection. Okay. All the all the four different symmetries this one has. Okay. Here are the translation arrows from here to here. If you shift from this point where four wings meet. To this point here, you recover the same image. Same thing from here to here. What about reflection? Can you see a reflection symmetry? Yes. Where? The bats. Okay, like this. What about the uh, the angels? Yes. Okay. So there's reflection symmetry. Okay. What about rotational symmetry? Yes. Where? The wings. Okay, what order rotational symmetry is this? Fourfold. Okay, are there any other rotational symmetries associated with this? Yes, no? Near the, near the legs, okay? Here. Okay, good. What sort of rotational symmetry is associated here? Twofold. Very good. 180 degrees. Okay? Okay? And then lastly, glide reflection. This is much harder to see. Okay? These are glide reflection axes. Okay? Now in order to, uh, to see this, and I have to do this because I couldn't uh, see it myself, is let's concentrate on this angel here. Okay? And let's concentrate on this axis that goes from here to here. Okay? So what do we have to do for glide reflection? We reflect, and then translate. Does everybody see that? You reflect, okay, look at here. So what I'm going to do is show you that this angel goes to this angel here under a glide reflection, okay? So I reflect, okay? Everybody see that? Okay, what about the other way? Let's see if we can do the other way. Okay, so now let's consider this axis. 
Okay, consider this axis here and these two angels. Okay, so what are we going to do? We reflect and then we translate. Okay, so then this angel goes to that. Okay. Okay. Here's a, a, a very nice illustration of how Escher went about producing wall tilings with recognizable figures. Okay? So it basically starts with a blank page, covers that page with a checkerboard pattern of uh, uh, parallelograms. He then takes the parallelograms and he deforms the parallelograms, but he deforms them in a very special way. Whatever he does to, say, one side of the parallelogram, if he takes away a little red, uh, red part here, he puts it over on the right-hand side. If he adds a little red here, he takes, so if he adds a little red here, he takes a little red away from that side. <laughs> Similarly up here, he took red away from the top, put it at the bottom. Okay? So the area of these red shades are actually equal to the areas of those red shapes. So he preserves the area with these deformations. Okay? Then he just makes the deformations more pronounced. And these become silhouettes of birds. Okay? If you look here, this looks like a black bird. This looks like a white bird. Okay? And he illustrates that more vividly by putting on, uh, by putting in a little bit of interior uh, detail. Okay? So you see here that this black silhouette is a black bird, okay? And that black bird is flying on a white background, which are actually white birds, okay? So the red birds flying on a white background become white birds flying on a red background, okay? So he's playing with what's figure and what's ground, what's figure and background. But then he said, well, we can have both white birds and red birds at the same time, which is shown here. Then he said, we don't even have to think of these as birds. We can think of these as fish, flying fish, okay, moving to the right. Okay, can everybody see that? So the birds flying to the right are now fish flying to the left. And then finally he says, well, we can have fish and birds. White fish flying to the left and red birds flying to the right. So it's really cool, at least uh, for me, to see how he does this, okay? Is that something to do with that, like what he was doing as he made it? And well, yeah, yeah, I mean, so he, what he had to do is he basically starts, so whenever he, he, he designs these, uh, these tilings using recognizable figures, he basically starts with some lattice of shapes, parallelograms, triangles, squares, and then he considers what sort of deformations he needs to do to those shapes in order to produce something that looks like a recognizable figure. And that's where the artistry comes in, for him to realize that, oh, this thing here looks like a bird. I wouldn't see that, but Asher, Asher did. And, and it was a very hard process. It was not an easy thing for him. So like number 12, that's the finished product, or does he keep all of that together? No, he keeps all that together. This is his whole thing. He has a lot of these metamorphous, or metamorphous prints where he actually shows this sort of process. Is it the, the angel and the demon are also like that? Like they are, they are the same uh, here? Uh, yeah, if, you, if we go back and look at the angels and, and demons, he, he basically created them starting from something like this. Okay? It's more complicated deformation, but it's all based on deformations of simple geometric shapes. Okay, now you might think that there are an infinite number of ways that you can do these wall tilings. You know, an infinite number of wallpaper patterns, if you will. And in some sense that's true, <laughs> but if you just concentrate on their symmetries, the types of symmetries that they have, you'll find that the, uh, the number of symmetries that different wall tilings can have is restricted to 17. So there are only 17 different wallpaper patterns or wall tilings out there as far as symmetry properties is concerned. Okay, this was discovered in 1891 by a Russian mathematician Fedora and then 
subsequently rediscovered by Pauline in 1924. Okay. It would take me the rest of the talk to try to explain these 17 different patterns. Okay. So I'm going to skip that and I'm going to tell you about one-dimensional patterns instead. So those are the border patterns, those Christmas trees that we were looking at in one of the Alhambra plots. And it turns out for border patterns, there's only seven different, uh, seven different patterns based on their symmetry properties. Okay, and here they are. Okay, here they are. So one through seven, and I label them with letters. Okay, so this is a pattern here that only has translational symmetry. Okay, it only has translational symmetry. So if I shift that L-shaped object to the right by the amount of that red arrow, it re the, the pattern repeats. Okay, T for translation. The next has both translation and horizontal reflection symmetry, right? If you reflect it around that horizontal axis, it's the same thing. There are little arrows pointing to the right. The next, T and V, what do you think T and V stand for? Translation and vertical. And vertical, okay? So there's vertical axes of symmetry here, so very good. <coughs> okay, T and G, what do you think T and G stand for? Translation and glide, okay? So you reflect around an axis here, a horizontal glide axis, shift forward and you recover that pattern. Okay, glide reflection symmetry is like walking, you know, footprints in the sand. Left, right, left, right. TR. Translation and rotation. What order rotation? What, what, what order of rotation? Do I rotate by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 180 degrees? That's all you can do, okay? T, V, H, and R. Okay, it has all, it has all of those, okay? So it has translational symmetry shown by the arrow. It has vertical reflection symmetry. It has horizontal reflection symmetry. And as an immediate consequence of having these three, it also has two-fold rotational symmetry. And then finally, we have TVGR, so translation, vertical reflection, glide symmetry, and rotation. Okay? Does everybody get this? Okay. So in order to test this, what I did last week is I went around the campus with a camera. And I took photographs uh, of different buildings, or inside different buildings, or outside different buildings, of different border patterns that I saw. Okay? And here they are. Does anybody recognize where that comes from? It's from the, one of the bathrooms. In the <laughs> okay? And if you go around campus, see if you, if you recognize these, okay? In the, in the future, okay? So what I want you to do is I want, I want to do a matching problem here. So match these border patterns with the symmetries here. What symmetries are associated with that? Somebody have a guess? So everything has translation. What else? Vertical, good. Horizontal. And very good, okay? What about the next one? Translation and vertical. Good. What about the next one? This is a little bit harder. Translation. Anything else? Look at this pattern here. Is this pattern symmetric? No. So it's not symmetric. So can you do anything other than translate it? No. What about the next one? <laughs> and it could, it could have duplicates here. Okay, translation, horizontal, and vertical, and rotational. Okay? What about this pattern here? Translation. Glide, why 
right to the hip line. Remember the footprints in the sand, right, left, right, left. Okay, if you look at it this way, you can see it. Okay, so it has glide. Okay, does it have rotational symmetry? No. Okay, so just translation and glide. What about this here? Horizontal? Does it have horizontal? Does it have horizontal? No. Does it have vertical? Yes. Okay, so translation, vertical, and glide. Very good. Okay? And then what about the last one? Translation and rotation. Okay? And that's it. Okay? Now you notice that we didn't have translation and horizontal, just horizontal reflection. Do you know why that's not a common border pattern? Do you remember the example that I showed on the previous uh, slide that had just horizontal symmetry? They were these little arrows, right, pointing, say, to the right. Okay? So if you have just TH, you would have something like arrows pointing to the right. Now why should you have arrows pointing to the right, say on the top of this room, and not arrows pointing to the left? Right? This right versus left, there's no reason why right is preferred versus left. Okay? So when, when people make these border patterns, there's no reason for them to you know, have a right going arrow unless they're you know, making exit strip you know, in an airplane or something like that. Okay? Okay. So that's, that's like the first half of the talk, okay? Or two-thirds of the talk. What I want to do now is I want to talk about different <laughs> representations of infinity. Okay? So how did Escher try to capture the infinite in his artwork? And there are three cases that will consider self-similarity, spirals, and this thing called point arrangement. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the transformations that we considered earlier and we're going to enlarge the possible transformations by allowing a reduction in size. Okay, so a similarity transformation keeps the shape the same but changes the size. So all of these triangles here have the same shape. The angles are the same but the sizes are different. Okay? That's what a similarity transformation is. Here you have stars which shrink as you go toward the center. Okay? That's called a dilation, a shrinking of the size as you go toward the center. Here you have shrinking, so dilation, and a rotation at the same time. So you shrink the size, rotate by 90, shrink the size, rotate by 90, shrink the size, rotate by 90. And if you repeat that pattern, you will have an infinite number of hearts here in this finite region. Okay? And that's what I actually wanted to do, is represent the infinite on a finite piece of paper. Okay? Here's a really neat print, okay? called Smaller and Smaller. Okay? So there are an infinite number, in principle, okay? lizards that go from the outside in. Okay? Now, Escher, in order to do this with his woodcut, uh, supposedly had like three magnifying glasses and a, a very sharp uh, cutting tool in order to make the, uh, the smallest lizard in here, which was less uh, than a millimeter in size, I believe. Okay? So you need a very steady hand in order to do that. Okay? Now, what's the scaffolding? How did he draw this? Did he just sit down and start? Sketching. Sketching. No. Okay? You, you, you can't do that. Okay? So he, he, he built a scaffolding, so to speak, on which the lizards fit. Okay? So let's consider this lizard here in the upper left-hand corner, and let's enclose it in a right triangle, a right uh, isosceles triangle. Okay? Now what can we do with a similarity transformation? We, we reduce the size. We make it smaller. We cut it in half, so it has half the area. And look what happens, okay? So this lizard is now reduced in half. It has half the area, and it fits here. It fits there. 
Okay? Then what do you do? You repeat the process. You take this triangle here, split it in half, and then you get these two lizards. Okay? Can people see the red in the background? Yes. Yes. Okay? Then you do it again. Okay? Then you do it again. And again. And again. And again. And again. <laughs> And again, okay? <laughs> so this is this is the scaffolding that he used, okay? This is the this is sort of the uh, the explanation of the of the trick, so to speak, okay? But at least to me, understanding how this scaffolding was constructed so that Escher could produce this print makes the print even have more value to me, okay? So understanding how he did it. More valuable. Uh, it is something more valuable uh, when I look at it. Oh, and one more. <laughs> here's here's another print. Same idea. Okay, same idea. Big lizards go to small lizards using similarity transformation. So you shrink the size, you get an infinite number of lizards. Okay, and there's the scaffolding for that. Okay, same idea. Okay. Here's a print called square limit print, which Escher really liked, and the reason why he liked it is because the uh, the objects the objects get smaller as you go to the boundary here, so they go from big in the center to small on the boundary rather than vice versa. Okay, because if you have big things here on the boundary, then why not have something bigger? over here, right? So there's not, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary that you cut it off with some big object over here. So he liked this. Aesthetically, this was a better representation of infinity, okay? And the scaffolding for that is based on the scaffolding that we just saw for this. So basically, take this scaffolding, reproduce it several times, and you get that, okay? And you can see that in each of these triangles, there's a fish, in two wings, a fish, two wings, a fish, two wings. Okay? Okay? So that's similarity transformations. Now we're going to talk about spirals, okay? These are two prints, spiral prints uh, by Escher, one called sphere spirals, and the other called sphere surface with fish, so these are black, uh, black and white fish spiraling around the globe. Okay, so just think of the Earth, the globe, and what you see here is that the, the fish are sort of spiraling away from the, uh, the North Pole, or they're going backwards, I guess, from here toward the pole. Okay? And they go through the equator and then down to the South Pole, and you can see that here. So this spiral starts here at the North Pole, goes down through the equator, and then ends here. Now this particular spiral uh, loops around the poles an infinite number of times. Okay? So infinity is represented by the number of loops that it makes around the pole. Okay? In principle it would go an infinite uh, number of times around the pole. But the curve itself is actually finite. Okay? If you measured the length of the curve, it would just be a finite length, even though it makes an infinite number of turns as you go around the pole, okay? This particular curve is not some arbitrary curve, arbitrary spiral. It has a special property. If you look at a line of longitude, which I show here in blue, and you look at a tangent to that spiral curve, you see that this angle here called the bearing angle is constant as you go from here to the next line of longitude, to the next line of longitude, etc. The bearing is constant. So the angle that the curve makes with the line, the different lines of longitude stay the same. Okay? This is called a loxodrome or a rung line. Again, this is something that I just learned a couple weeks ago. But it was used, this type of path was actually used by navigators back in the 1500s when they were sailing their ships you know, across the globe. Okay? So they would go on these lines of constant bearing because that was something that they could um, practically do. Okay? 
it was very hard for them to readjust their bearing as they went somewhere. So they would keep the bearing fixed. Okay? So these are special, these are special curves used by navigators, you know, back in the 1500s. And these are the curves that Escher used in these particular drawings. Okay, and like I said, the length of the curve is finite, and this is the formula for it, even though in principle it makes an infinite number of loops around the pole. If you take the globe and you project it, do this thing called stereographic projection, you can take the, you know, the two-dimensional globe and project it onto a flat piece of paper. Okay? This is a stereographic projection of the northern hemisphere. The north pole is here. When you do this type of projection, you distort the size of objects. Okay? The size here of these countries are actually, they appear bigger than what they really are because of the, uh, the projection, the way that this map was uh, created. So you take the, you know, the, the two-dimensional surface of the globe in three dimensions, collapse it to a flat two-dimensional surface, and this is what we get. And now if you take that boxodrome, that spiral, and you project that as well, this is what you get, okay? So you take the loxodrome, you project it using the stereographic projection, and the curve has a very special form. It's related to this thing called an exponential. We're not going to need to know uh, details about that. But this is what's called a logarithmic spiral. Okay, it's a very special spiral. It's so special that Jacob Bernoulli, who was a physicist mathematician back in the uh, late 1600s, called it the Spira Mirabilis. Does anybody think Latin? No? You don't learn that anymore? <laughs> what do you think this means? Spiral, spiral. <laughs> Mirabilis. <laughs> Mirac miraculous, okay, the miraculous spiral, okay, the, he called it the miraculous spiral because of the property that it has. It's a, it's a self-similar spiral, okay, it's self-similar in the sense that if you zoom in on a smaller area of it, it looks exactly the same as the, the bigger spiral, okay, so it has this property. If you measure, say, the distance from here to here, and the distance from here to here, and you take their ratio, okay, so this distance to this distance, say it's two to one, then that's the same as this distance to that distance, which is the same as this distance to that distance, okay? So the radius decreases by the same constant factor as you go from one term to the next to the next, okay? So it's the miraculous spiral that, uh, that, that we're newly uh, Okay. Here's a print called Whirlpools, okay, which Escher made in 1957. <coughs> Are these curves, you know, that uh, go down the, uh, the backs of the redfish and the grayfish? Are they just freehand spirals that he drew? No. No. Okay. Escher never did anything without some reason. Okay. Okay. If you look at the redfish. Okay, and you say take the distance from the center here out, you measure it, and I measured it, okay, with a ruler. And you do it, you do you measure this distance, then you measure the distance from the center to the next one, okay, for the next uh, red fish, and then you do it again, and you take their ratio, you'll see that the ratio is constant. And if you use that constant ratio and you substitute it into that formula, that exponential formula that I showed you for the logarithmic spiral, you would get this. Okay? So you find that the, this spiral here decreases. It becomes this distance here is half as far as this distance. Okay? So if this is, say, one unit from here to here, this is a half of a unit. This is a quarter. This is an eighth. Okay? So there's a dilation of a half for a 360 degree rotation. Take those numbers, stick it into the formula for the logarithmic spiral, produce it, overlay it on this figure, bam, okay, that's what you get. Okay? What about the uh, spiral through the great fish? Same thing, okay? 
And you can get that by just taking, say, this logarithmic spiral, dilate it, right? You make it smaller, and then it fits right on top of that spiral, of the uh, spiral going through the grid. Here's another example where there's spirals. Can you see spirals in here? Yes. How did the spirals go? Okay. <laughs> If you, okay, if you look here, okay, let's see. Suppose we take this, this lizard, okay, and then go from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, then it will spiral into the center, okay? So what do you do? You take a line, say, from here, from the center there, and then you measure the angle to here. What angle is that? 45. Not 45, but half of 45. Okay, so 22.5 degrees. Okay. And as you go from here to here, you measure the height of the lizard. And again, that's something that I did. And you take the ratio, you'll find that the ratio is 0.8. Okay? So there's a dilation of 0.8 for each 22.5 degree turn. So what I did is I drew radial lines every 22.5 degrees. Then I draw, drew circles so that this circle here is 0.8 times the radius of this circle. This one's 0.8 of that, 0.8 of that, etc. So that's how the radii, uh, the radii of those circles decrease. And then you just connect this, with this, with this, with this, with a logarithmic spiral, and this is what you get, okay? So again, here's the logarithmic spiral. We saw it in the context of the uh, sphere surface with fish. We saw it in whirlpools. We see it here as well, okay? And finally, we see it in this, this, uh, this print as well by Escher in 1958 is called Path of Life, and he's representing actually here the cycle of life from birth to maturity, maturity to middle age or old age, and then to death, okay? So you've got white fish and you've got black fish, and you can actually follow the white fish from the center out, so there's a spiraling of white fish from the center out, so they're born in the center, they mature, they reach mid-age, okay, over here, say. Okay, so the white fish comes over here. Then the white fish morphs into a black fish. And then you follow the black fish into the center. Okay? And what type of spiral do you think this is? A logarithmic spiral. Okay? So th those are the spirals for the white fish from the center out. Those are the spirals for the black fish in. Okay, again, logarithmic spirals. Okay, so the last, the last topic in regard to representations of infinity is probably the hardest one to get your head around, so I'm going to need as much concentration as possible. Okay? And it's this thing called the point array disk. Okay? What is it? It's basically a finite model, so it represents in a finite amount of space in the disk, an infinite space, so it's a finite model of an infinite space that has constant negative curvature. Now you might say, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> now, negative curvature, okay, let's, let's, let's think back here uh, to a plane, okay? This is a flat piece of paper, okay? All the stuff that you learned in geometry, or are learning in geometry, the so-called Euclidean geometry, is the geometry that holds on a flat piece of paper. So if you draw a straight line, and you form a triangle, you add up the angles of the triangle, you get 180 degrees. If you draw two parallel lines, those parallel lines never intersect. That's Euclidean geometry. The surface of a sphere, on the other hand, is a, an example of a non-Euclidean geometry, it has positive curvature, okay? It's a spherical surface, positive curvature, 
And what I mean by positive curvature is that if you take the straight lines on the sphere, which are the shortest distance path between two points, okay? Take those straight lines on the sphere, and you draw a triangle, and you take this angle plus this angle plus this angle, what would you get? 180 degrees? No, you get more than 180 degrees, okay? So for a positively curved space, the sum of the angles of a triangle is greater than 180 degrees. For a negatively curved space, which is what we're, you know, we're going to concentrate on, that's this. This is a piece of a negatively curved uh, space. Think of it as a saddle surface or as a Pringles potato chip. Okay? If you draw the straight lines on this surface here, so the shortest distance paths, and form a triangle, and you add up the angles here, what would you get? Less than 180 degrees, okay? So negative curvature just means that when you take a triangle and you sum up the angles, you get something less than 180 degrees. Positive curvature, sum up the angles, something more than 180 degrees, okay? Also, if you draw parallel lines here, so two initially parallel lines, say lines of longitude on the globe, they will intersect at the North Pole. So parallel lines intersect here. For this negatively curved space, parallel lines diverge. Okay, so you can have more than one line parallel to another part. Okay? So that's what I say here. This is a representation, a finite representation of it. The straight line paths, the shortest distance paths in this negatively curved space are represented in this point array disk by circles that intersect the boundary at right angles. Okay? So this is actually a straight line in the negatively curved space. Okay? Even though it doesn't look straight, okay, it is a straight line. Okay? The boundary here of this disk is actually infinitely far away in this negatively curved space. Okay? So we're taking this infinite space and we're trying to represent it in this finite disk. Infinity is here. Okay? Now, just like we saw for stereographic projection, we saw how distances were distorted as we went to the equator. Well, here, distances are distorted as well. As you go from the center out to the edge, these stick figures here actually all have the same size. Okay? In the negatively curved space, they all have the same size. But in this particular representation, they just appear smaller. Just like in the stereographic projection, the, uh, the countries you know, have a certain size, but in the stereographic projection, it looks bigger than what it really is. So these stick figures here all have the same size, and the distance between the stick figure here to here, here to here, those distances are the same. So if this stick, stick figure took one step to go here, this is another one step to go here, one step to go here. Okay? Does everybody understand this? This is the hardest, most complicated of all the slides. Okay. And here's an example of a triangle. This is an example of a triangle in this negatively curved space. It's made up of arcs of circles that intersect the boundary at right angles. So if I extended this curve, it would intersect the boundary at right angles. Extend this curve, extend that curve. Okay? What about the sum of the angles here? Less than 180 degrees? <laughs> Yes, okay, if you measure, you take your compass and you measure this, you would find that the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees. <coughs> Almost done, okay. Here's an example of a tiling. So you can talk about tilings of the point array disk in the same way that you can talk about tilings of this wall. Okay, you have tilings of flat space, you have tilings of a negatively curved space. Here's an example of a tiling of the point array disk using equilateral triangles where the angles here are 45 degrees. 45 plus 45 plus 45, is that equal to 180? 
No, it's less than 180. It's 135 degrees. Yet these are equilateral triangles. This triangle here has the same area as this triangle here. It has the same area as this triangle here. This triangle here. This triangle here. All these triangles have the same size, the same area, the same shape in the negatively curved space, although they appear not to on this space here, on this particular representation. So that particular figure there is basically the analog of this figure here. For a flat, for flat space, you can tile a flat space with equilateral triangles here, 60, 60, 60. Okay? This picture here, when you look at it in a negatively curved space, you get this. Okay? These triangles don't extend out to the boundary because I wasn't able to sort of write my program to go all the way. Uh, okay? But you can imagine, you can imagine uh, sort of extending this. Here's another tiling of the point array disk using triangles, equilateral triangles. What are the angles of these triangles? Zero, zero, and zero. So when you sum up the angles of this triangle, what do you get? Zero. So here's an example of an equilateral triangle whose angles are all zero degrees. Okay? This triangle in the middle here has the same area as this triangle here, which has the same area as this triangle here, which has the same area as this triangle. Okay? So although they appear to be smaller as you go to the boundary, they actually have the same area. Okay? So this is how Escher is going to represent infinity, by basically considering these different tilings of the point array like this. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, Escher corresponded with this mathematician Coxeter. In 1958, Coxeter sent him this figure here which is the point array disk tiled with 30, 45, 90 triangles. So if you measure the angles here, this is 30 degrees, this is 45, this is 90. So this is a tiling of the point array disk in the same way that I showed you just two other tilings. Okay? Now when Escher got this diagram, not being trained in mathematics, he didn't understand the deep mathematics that, were, uh, that was underlying it. But he said, great, this is exactly what I was looking for. I wanted some, something to represent infinity going from the center outward in, in, in the form of a circle. So this is exactly what he was looking for. And what he did, okay, not being a mathematician, but being very skilled with a compass and straight edge, he was able to reproduce the scaffolding. Okay? So these are lines that Escher drew. They're, they're computer reconstructed. Okay, to make them a little bit more uh, prominent here in this, in this figure. But he basically reconstructed the scaffolding just using a compass and a straight edge. He didn't know about Poincaré disk, he didn't know about negative curvature, he didn't know about hyperbolic versus spherical. He was just skilled with his compass and ruler, so he was able to produce this scaffolding. Okay, just using that. And using that scaffolding, he was able to produce this particular print here called Circle Limit 1. They're black fish and white fish that appear to get smaller as they go to the boundary, but in reality, in the negatively curved space, they all have the same size, the same area. Escher wasn't pleased with this particular print because the fish were very angular, they didn't look very real, and also the traffic flow of the fish wasn't very good. You know, you've got a fish, a black fish traveling this way, a, another black fish traveling in the opposite direction, which then sort of hits a white fish traveling toward it, okay? And then the white fish, right, the two white fish travel toward one another, the two black fish travel away from one another. So although this was uh, a print that he produced, it wasn't something that was aesthetically pleasing to him, okay? And what I show here is, is the scaffolding uh, based on hexagons. Okay, so this is a hexagon here, a six-sided figure 
meaning four at a, at, at a vertex. Okay, so six four stands for hexagon, four of them meaning at a vertex. So this here is actually a hexagon. This is actually a hexagon. All having the same area. Okay, and that's the full scaffolding using the 30, 45, 90 triangles. This is an improvement. This is called circle limit three. The other uh, print was circle limit one. Note the, the improved uh, representation of the fish, okay? They're not as angular. They're more round. They're more organic. Also, the traffic flow is nice, right? The green fish all travel this way. The yellow fish all travel this way. The blue fish all travel that way, okay? So he was very, very happy with this, okay? The scaffolding for this is different, okay? It's not hexagons meaning four at a side, but it's actually octagons, so eight-sided figures, meaning three at a vertex. Okay, so it's a different scaffolding, uh, but it, it still works. It's still a, a tiling of the point array disk. The white lines here, you might think, are, are, are orthogonal circles, that, uh, circles that meet the boundary at right angles. They're not actually, if you, if you draw uh, a line through these two points here and check to see if this uh, white, uh, white curve is one of these orthogonal circles, is it? One might say, well, that's a flaw in Escher's uh, diagram, but he didn't care. Okay? It didn't matter to him. I mean, it's not, it's not important for the representation that he wanted to show. And finally, this is circle limit four. Heaven and hell, remember that uh, image that I showed at the very beginning? This is his fourth circle limit print. Here's a, uh, a scaffolding uh, based on 6-4 tiling, so it has the same scaffolding as the first circle limit print that he had. These red dots here, what do the red dots represent? Rotation, what's this? Threefold good, what's this? Fourfold, good. Looks like you've been paying attention. Okay, and let me conclude that. Okay, and the way that I'm going to conclude is this: I'm going to uh, read a quote by a, a, a contemporary artist, Istvan Doros, who said, "The most terrible experience for us artists is when a viewer at an exhibition stops for half a second in front of our work and then walks on to the next one." This is impossible in front of a print by Escher, and usually I feel when I see his work in an exhibition or a book, that after some minutes the picture is not important anymore, the important thing is the thinking, the mysterium. Okay? So you can't just flip through an Escher book, you're just entranced by that image, and then you start to think about it. Okay? Now, if you want to do some thinking, more thinking on your own, I list here some references. There are very good resources on the, uh, the web. Uh, I, I put stars on the ones that I find uh, found to be most important. And anybody who wants to, uh, to flip through some of the books, I know you're not going to be able to just flip through without being uh, sort of entranced. Here are, are some here, so you're welcome to look uh, before you So. Oh. How long did it take you?